Thank you. Is, is my mic on? All right, good. <clears throat> well, good afternoon. My name is Scott Flynn, and um, I work for Dow AgriSciences these days, but up until August of last year, I spent four years of my life working on the project that I'm going to be talking about today. And if you were at the opening session this morning, uh, you heard a speaker talk about uh, the conversion of cellulosic ethanol, uh, or cellulosic bio, uh, bio stock into, uh, into fuel. And that's part of the reason why I'm talking about uh, the topic I am today. But my job was basically to evaluate grass and legumes uh, as potential perennial ground covers in systems where the biomass or the corn stover would be removed. So the, this all started back in 2006 when we first wrote a grant. And the, you heard this morning that we talk about in five years we'll have things where we need them to be. In five years we'll have, uh, we'll have uh, the systems where we need them to be. And we knew that as cellulosic material uh, became more cost effective in, in terms of uh, converting that feedstock into, into biofuels, that farmers are going to be tempted to remove as much of that corn stover as possible uh, and actually sell it. And that's going to have some very devastating long-term effects in, in soil erosion. So if you look in the literature, a lot of times you'll see a perennial ground cover uh, actually referred to as a living mulch, and we prefer to call them uh, perennial ground covers. And depending on who you, uh, who you talk to, they may define a perennial ground cover a little different. Now, the way I define a perennial ground cover, uh, I think, is uh, a little more encompassing of actually what they are. But I define it as an annual or perennial plant that's interceded in a row crop to confer some type of ecological, economical, or environmental benefit to the system. Now, I've included annual into that definition, even though I am saying, calling it a perennial ground cover is because a lot of the times the species that we are growing in these row crops, we expect to self-reseed themselves and be back the next year. So the cover will be perennial, even though the plant uh, uh, may be an annual. So just a couple of benefits of, of perennial ground covers uh, uh, from the literature. We can see reductions in soil erosion and soil runoff. And some of the studies have seen anywhere from 85 maybe up to 98% reduction in soil erosion and soil runoff if we can find the right type of perennial ground cover uh, uh, to grow. Weed suppression is also a big benefit to these systems because we create this nice dense canopy uh, that prevents sunlight from getting down to the soil surface and, uh, and suppressing weeds. There's also the reduction in insect pests and a lot of times that's through harboring predatory insects within that perennial ground cover that will actually feed on uh, uh, the insects that may damage the crop. We see increased microbial uh, biomass in the soil and that's primarily uh, facilitated through root exudates. We also, in, in one particular study, and I believe this was actually in Europe, we saw increases or, or the authors saw increases in our buscular mycorrhizal uh, colonization uh, in row crops. And then this was the odd one. This was something that kind of surprised me, is we can actually see increases in soil moisture, indicating that the evapotranspiration from a perennial ground cover canopy may be far less than the evaporation from bare soil alone. And that's pretty encouraging. But again, it appears that it's very species specific. Now the objective of this study, and I'm going to break these down into two separate objectives. The overall objective to the grant that was written to support this study was to look at three different manage or three different systems. One, the corn genetics portion of the system. Can we develop uh, or can we make crosses uh, with the different corn lines to develop a corn hybrid that tends to tolerate uh, a perennial ground cover or say weed pressure more so than others. The other thing is the crop management portion. And this was done to look primarily at either strip tillage or chemical suppression or other types of management that could be used when growing a perennial ground cover in these particular row crops. And then my portion of this study was actually to look at the perennial ground cover species themselves and evaluate them in terms of which ones would be the most suitable to grow with that row crop. So I actually had two objectives I, I think of. One was to find that species, if possible, 
uh, identifying the best species that we uh, that could possibly be grown with corn. But the other thing that I found would it was probably be beneficial to us to try to identify an idiotype. We know these particular species because we worked with them uh, in the forage realm for years. But what were the characteristics of the most successful species, and can we use those characteristics in the future to identify other species? So our experiment was set up as a split block in time uh, with 35 different species and a control on three different landscape positions, uh, replicated three times over three years. And if you look, this is one replication. Here are the three landscape positions. The ground covers are established from the toe slope to the summit. So what you have here is this particular ground species or ground cover species here on the end is the exact same here and here. So the ground cover species are planted this way, the corn was planted this way in the particular plots. And you can actually see the control plot right there. Um, it uh, looks like the tallest one in the field. Our mulch species were established in 2006 and 2007 when I got to Iowa State in 2007 a lot of those species had not established well. And so I went back in and gave them another try uh, using the tire drill, which was what was uh, used to establish them the first time. Anything that did not establish well then, I came back in that later on that fall and used a brilliant roller, because that appeared to be one of the major problems was good seed to soil contact. And uh, usually I got them with the, the, the brilliant roller. <coughs> there were a few species that still were rough to establish. Corn planting dates. Uh, in Iowa, we generally like to see corn planted somewhere between April the 20th and, and May the 5th. And you can see that here we were pretty late uh, in 2008 and 2009. And that's because the weather that we had during those years, it was so wet that we couldn't get into the field. The last year in, in, in 2010 was the only year we could actually get in the field on time. Corn management, we planted those, uh, uh, planted those plots at about 80,000 plants per hectare. We preferred to do spring, uh, spring till or fall tillage, but we ended up using both spring and fall strip tillage because a lot of times in the fall we'd be getting the corn out so late and then the weather would, uh, would turn bad on us that we would be forced to, uh, to try to strip till in the spring. And then we came in after those, uh, those plants emerged and we bound it on Roundup at about V2 to V4 to suppress any weeds that came up into that strip tillage row. That, that strip tillage is, is uh, tearing up an area of roughly 30 centimeters or 12 inches uh, for that corn plant to come up in. The types of data we collected were grain yield, stover yield, populations at harvest, ear counts, uh, plant heights on two week intervals, and we usually started around uh, V6 for that. Spring ground cover, uh, which we estimated with NDVI in the spring, and uh, we used a digital image analysis. Uh, in the fall after the corn was harvested um, for fall ground cover and then soil fertility data. Now I'm not going to get into the soil fertility data today. Um, uh, I'm still working on that portion of the data. So the different species we looked at, I break these into about nine different functional groups. Uh, we have our wheat grasses uh, or what I would consider uh, uh, tall uh, jointing cool season grasses. So we have our wheat grasses and our wild rice in there. We have our bent grasses, we have our fine leafed fescues, then we have what I would consider more clump forming coarse leafed grasses. We have uh, the creeping foxtail, meadow foxtail, which I would advise anyone in here to never plant these in a research plot because they'll be in every other research plot that you have on the farm. Weediest grass species I've ever dealt with. Alpine bluegrass, Canada bluegrass, the rest of these bluegrasses are, are fine leafed, they're not really well known, um, but they're very low growing. Side oats grama, blue grama, buffalo grass, weeping low grass, so our C4s, our legumes, and then some just oddball grasses in here. So some significant observations. Uh, only 19 of these ground cover species actually survived all three years of this study. Uh, so we lost a considerable number of them to things such as uh, winter kill. Sometimes they just didn't tolerate shade and things of that nature. There was a year by species interaction, so I'm going to be just talking about uh, things on an individual year basis. One of the things that I think was very surprising, about, well not very surprising, but was very obvious about this, if we had to delay corn planting, we gave us competitive advantage to a lot of those C3 species, and uh, it, it could really hurt corn yield if they uh, had too much of an advantage. Another thing is the signs of stress 
occurred shortly after those plants actually emerged. So they were being stressed way before um, they had time to, uh, uh, to start elongating. So looking at the data here, I've cut out a lot of the data. I'm going to show you the top and the, and the bottom uh, are the, the worst yield, uh, yielding species in my study. Alpine bluegrass, white clover, and bird's foot trefoil, 5.7 to 7 megagrams per hectare. Best yielding treatments, but they still reduced yield 23 to 37 percent. When we look at our, our uh, poorer yielding species, the foxtails, uh, the bent grass, and the red top, uh, 77 to 97 per, or 99 percent reduction in yield. <coughs> When we look, not all species had poor yield just because of, of, of poor uh, development of that ear. Some were having difficulty with, uh, with populations because that particular ground cover species would actually encroach back into the row. <coughs> uh, ears per plant, we were having some plants that would not have an ear at all. And then the harvest index was also much lower. In 2009, saw something very similar, 25 to 45 percent. But notice that those top yielding species in 2008 are no longer here. They didn't survive uh, through the winter of 2008. <clears throat> and then we have our, our same species that uh, brought up the, the in, rear of the pack um, in 2008. But again, look here. We're, those species that really destroyed corn yield, they're affecting things such as harvest index, population, and ears per plant. Now this is something very interesting to me. We could actually, um, we could almost estimate what plots would be the highest yielding in the field by looking at their heights at about growth stage V6. In 2008, when I started this study, I went out and took plant height measurements at V6, or I'm sorry, uh, V4. The control was the shortest pl uh, plot in the field. All the other grass uh, or ground cover species had produced significantly taller plants. Well, I say uh, most species. 80% uh, of the species had produced significantly taller plants. What this is an indication of is shade avoidance. That we may actually be creating a different phenotype in corn early on in the season that constrains our yield uh, later in the season. But this is one of the relationships we saw very early on. This is 22 days after emergence. We're out taking uh, height measurements. By day 42, we start to see a significant linear relationship between corn height and final grain yield. So the yields of these plots were being determined very early on. So ground cover height. If most species provided at least 50% ground cover or more in spring and fall, if we got above 70% ground cover, a lot of times we saw uh, detrimental effects to yield. And that usually came at the hands of things like population and harvest index. Mature height of surviving species if that species was over 50 centimeters tall, uh, we, we could uh, see it was conducive to the, to the higher yields. We got over 70 inches, we really, uh, we really hurt corn yield. So in conclusion, the shorter species, they tend to produce the higher yields. Also, the species that do not encroach back into that row as aggressively also tend to produce higher yields. And I think this is uh, very much related to the red-far red ratio in the signaling in the corn plant. <clears throat> if we had cooler spring conditions, we better watch out because we're going to hurt corn yields. If we had a frost event early in the spring or later in the spring, uh, we could hurt corn yield and give the competitive advantage to those C3s. And I would say beyond a doubt that uh, shade avoidance is an uh, a issue with uh, corn yields. So if I had to choose, I'd go with meadow fescue, colonial bent grass, Canada bluegrass, or foul bluegrass. They're low growing, they're not very aggressive, and they performed well in the trial. If I had to choose an idiotype, I want it to be shade tolerant. I want it to be clump forming, so when I strip till it, it stays where I, where I strip till it to. I want it to be low growing, and I want it to be late green up. Now, the first thing that came to my mind when I saw this, C4. <laughs> and I, people almost fell over when I said I thought a C4 grass would be the best to grow with corn. So in 2009, I started a little project on the side where I used nimble will. Nimble will, if you're familiar with it, is a, is a weed and turf. I grew nimble will, has very late to green up, very low growing, very shallow rooting. Grew 193 bushel corn in nimble will. The control had 196. So here are my references. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to try to entertain them at this time. <clears throat>
Yes, it, it, it's possible to, to do mixtures, but it's going to be difficult. The question is, um, is it possible to mix these species? And yes, it is, but uh, that's, that's a little bit beyond. That's probably a, another step. Right. Okay, the question is, what about crown vetch? Crown vetch has been used in the past, and they've had, had some success with it. Uh, legumes are a lot of times, people flock to legumes as perennial ground covers. I see no benefit of having a legume. So in order to get the level of corn production that you need, you have to apply nitrogen even with the legume. By the time you apply nitrogen, what you've done is you've inhibited that legume from fixing nitrogen. And so there's really no benefit to it. Uh, yes, there are experiments out there that show crown vetch has some success, but again, I think we need to be looking uh, at shorter, lower growing species that don't spread as aggressively. So. With three reps in a small plot? Yeah. How reliable? My the question is, how reliable is my corn data with three reps? Huh? with three reps in a small plot, I think it's probably pretty reliable in terms of separating out the different treatments. I'm not going to say that if you were to go out and plant corn in a particular ground cover that this is what you're going to get, but I think as far as ranking the treatments in this particular experiment, I think it was probably very, very effective the way we carried it out. I can't guarantee you that you're going to get seven, uh, uh, seven megagrams of dry matter per hectare with uh, alpine bluegrass, but then again. 